The war had its origins in Europe, but while there was a lot of fighting within that continent, it was a global conflict from the beginning. At the start of the war, the Japanese Empire was already locking horns with Germany and China and the Pacific Islands. And when the Ottoman Empire, which stretched from the Balkans to the Persian Gulf, joined in late 1914, it truly became a world war. There were naval battles in the South Pacific and South Atlantic. Soldiers from every continent except Antarctica would fight. There were fronts in Persia, Mesopotamia, Libya, even the borders of India, and fighting all over Africa as European colonies changed hands. Towards the end of the war, the United States and Brazil would also join in the fighting. It was the first truly global war and the largest in history at the time. of all the great empires, Austria-Hungary had 15 different language versions of its national anthem. While its internal workings, that often valued heritage over ability, left it somewhat in a state of decay by 1914, the empire still dreamed of expanding its influence throughout the Balkans and perhaps one day all the way to Persia. In 1908, Austria-Hungary had annexed Bosnia, making Serbia the next in line, and if Serbia fell, Russia would lose all influence in the Balkan region. Germany, and especially Kaiser Wilhelm II, dreamed of a greater colonial empire and a greater German hegemony in the concert of Europe. A big concern for Germany was the expansion of the Russian railway system. In 1914, German Chancellor von Bethmann Hollweg stated that within three years, Russia would be able to mobilize troops so quickly that the German advantage in technology would not be able to overcome the Russian advantage in manpower. To win the war, they had to act quickly. What Germany feared was a war on two fronts, so their battle plan was to defeat France and then focus the entire German military might on the Russian Empire. Italy had been an ally of Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war, but when it broke out in 1914, they claimed that the alliance was only a defensive war and Italy had no obligation to join an offensive war. However, one year later, Italy joined the war siding with the Allies, hoping to reclaim lost Italian lands that were now part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Italian front was characterized by mountains. The amount of soldiers wounded compared to killed was far greater there than other fronts, because stray bullets would splinter the rock into deadly projectiles that were particularly dangerous to eyes and faces. Although the 600-year-old Ottoman Empire was huge, stretching from the Balkans to the Persian Gulf, it was in decay and had lost wars to both Italy and a Balkan alliance in the years preceding the First World War. However, the Ottoman Empire would still prove to be a formidable opponent, with the Young Turks movement and the institution of a constitutional government having paved the way for modernization in all aspects of life, including the military. Minister of War Enver Pasha, one of the three Pashas who basically ran the empire during the war, dreamed of a modern Turkish nation that did not look to the Arab world for guidance, but looked to itself. His dream would one day come true, but he would not live to see it. In 1914, a quarter of the world was controlled by the British Empire, and the colonies were secured by Britain's supreme naval power. At the time, the British Army was quite small compared to the other European powers, but it was the only fully professional regular army in Europe, and the soldiers were highly efficient despite their small numbers. 
Fearing the expansion of German influence, Britain guaranteed Belgium's neutrality, meaning that an attack on Belgium was an attack on Britain, and all the corners of the global empire would join the fight. By 1910, the United States had become the world's leading industrial power. Though they remained neutral for the first few years of the war, American industry and finance played a major role. Initially, American reaction to the war was mixed. While the greatest number of immigrants in the States were from Britain, including Ireland, Germans were second, and there was sympathy for both sides. However, when the war began, Britain cut Germany's transatlantic cable, so all American reports of the war were rooted through Britain, and only what was favorable passed the censors. Also, events like the sinking of the ocean liner Lusitania and the execution of Edith Cavell inflamed the American public, and the war with Germany soon loomed large. British Royal Marines were traditionally light infantry that accompanied the Royal Navy into the conflict zones of the Empire. The Marines were Navy sailors, whose mission it was to provide the first landing party or secure beachheads during amphibious operations. Their uniform was navy blue with splashes of khaki, they were allowed to grow beards, and they only received naval pay for a long time, which was less than army pay. In August 1914, Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, wanted the inclusion of surplus naval personnel and light artillery into the Royal Marines Reserves to create the 63rd Royal Naval Division. The division first supported the British forces at Antwerp and later fought at the battles of Gallipoli, the Somme and Passchendaele. At the outbreak of the war, the Russian Empire was able to mobilize nearly 5 million men in 115 infantry divisions and 38 cavalry divisions. The infantry was equipped with a Vintovka Moisina version of the 7.62mm bolt-action rifle Moisin Nagant 1891. And each infantry regiment clad in modern green khaki uniforms fielded eight belt-fed and water-cooled Maxim M1910 machine guns and was supported by the Putilov 76.2mm field gun. Alongside them fought the Lancers, Dragoons, Hussars and Cossacks, all with long, glorious military traditions of service. Airplanes and armoured car divisions had the ability to quickly alter the dynamic of the battlefield. And Russia had two great advantages, land and men. There were, however, doubts that Russia's military was ready to fight a modern war. With a population of nearly 170 million people, the Russian Empire could call upon more soldiers than any other European nation. But coming from mostly agrarian, deeply religious and often superstitious societies, the regular Russian conscript got little more than a rudimentary training of basic soldier skills. The higher literacy rate made broad communications difficult, and this also affected complex tactical decisions. The general staff and officer corps suffered from internal political scheming, mistrust and personal jealousies between commanders, and rampant nepotism stood in the way of tactical innovation. Also, the belief that the bayonet was mightier than the bullet made soldiers' lives expendable and casualties acceptable. Still, Though Russia would suffer catastrophic defeats, Tannenberg, Masurian Lakes, she would also achieve glorious victories, like the Brasilov Offensive, which nearly knocked Austria-Hungary out of the war. Also, Russia could give up endless amounts of land, drawing the enemy further and further from his supplies and reserves, leaving it open to a counter-strike. It was a mighty army indeed.
Many celebrated names of the 20th century served in the Great War in their youth. Authors such as J.R.R. R. Tolkien and Ernest Hemingway, and the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, to name but a few. For many others, it was the war that made them famous. Matahari, the Red Baron, Edith Cavell, Lawrence of Arabia, and infamous Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, George Patton. There were also those who opposed the war, whose influence on our world would be enormous, Albert Einstein and Vladimir Lenin. It was, to put it simply, an age of heroes and legends in the face of an apocalypse. Contrary to the stereotype of weeping and waiting at home while their men were away fighting, women served the war effort of their nations in huge numbers. They were munition factory workers, nurses, airplane mechanics, and spies. They were Vera Britton and Matahari. Some risked their lives working with dangerous chemicals for munitions, becoming known as canaries for the yellow tint the sulfur gave their skin. In addition to military work, the percentage of women in the civilian labor force nearly doubled in some nations, but grew in all. And indeed, some even fought at the front. Flora Sanders, Melanka Savic, Helen Ruse, Olga Kokoseva, and of course, the Russian Women's Battalion of Death, led by Maria Bokarevka. They were vital to propaganda efforts, and in many countries, the taking on of traditional male roles was the final push toward giving women the vote. Britain, Germany, Russia, Poland, the USA, and Austria all granted women suffrage shortly after the war.